Okay. We're recording. So I, I wrote a little article that's called Media, Message, and Meaning, an Introduction to Torah Study. That's on the background of this wonderful uh, picture of the universe. You, you should know that, uh, I don't know if you heard, but recently they've been getting these uh, uh, signals uh, that they've been capturing these large uh, Telescopes, uh, what is that called? Electronic listening devices, and it's it's coming every three months or something, some sort of beeps or something, and they're trying to figure out where it's coming from. Wow. And there's a great a little um, video that I would suggest people see, which is called uh, "Belief in God in Five Minutes," where I don't know if you've seen it. Um, uh, who is the professor in the old city? Uh, professor Schroeder is his name. <clears throat> oh, you can right. find it online. You said Schroeder? Schroeder. Schroeder oh, wow, yeah. And, and what he explains is from a very interesting picture in NASA, they've sent out uh, these satellites to sort of get to the end of the universe or discover it. And uh, they have this computer-generated uh, picture of how big the universe is. And he asks, well, at the edge of the universe, what happens next? The universe is finite, and the latest uh, scientific understanding is this Big Bang theory, which is very close to what the Torah says, that Kodesh Baruch Hu, uh, it actually says in the Torah that the uh, in the, that uh, uh, the not in the Torah, but one of the Mephorshims, the Ramban, explains that the whole world was started from one small uh, speck, one small dot um, that had everything in it, and then it expanded, which is exactly what they're coming to now because they're looking at the universe and they're seeing that uh, the uh, universe is expanding by looking at the light waves of the various uh, planets and stars and uh, nebulae in the universe. So the question is, what's at the edge of the universe? So they don't, they can't ever find that out because it, we, we live inside place and time and there's no way that we can conceive of no place, no time. So the universe is finite. And it was created by this. Uh, and, and what's the, the other side of the universe is the creator. It, that's a different dimension. It's not a dimension that we understand and will ever understand. And Kodesh Baruch, who, uh, who's the creator of the whole universe, where the universe is called, we're in his place, but he's not anywhere the place of the universe. I mean, he's much, place doesn't even, uh, can explain Kodesh Baruch. Okay, so that's another media. Sometimes I use the marshal as if a fish was trying to talk to you through the fish tank. So he sees some sort of space running around every once in a while there's food coming on the top of the each, but he doesn't, he could not, he could never conceive what it means to be a human being. So the great challenge is how does the, the Kodesh Baruch communicate with us? So they're looking for physical manifestations of these beeps that are coming from out of space, maybe we'll find spacemen. But on Har Sinai, uh, 3,300 years ago, the Kodesh Baruch Hu revealed himself to us in the form of the Sefer Torah. Okay? So I wrote this little introduction. I won't read it all to you, uh, but it's very, very interesting. Um, the media that the Kodesh Baruch Hu uses to talk to us, imagine if you had to talk to fish. I mean, Shlomo Melech knew how to talk to animals. Imagine if you knew fish language, okay? So you'd speak, you know, bubble talk, right? Or else if you speak English to a fish or Japanese, he won't understand you. He can only understand bubble language. So the Kodesh Baruch Hu has to find a method for us to communicate with him, and that's called language. And the, the primal language was Lashon uh, Hebrew. And that's the media 
that he uses to communicate with us, okay? He used to appear to, like in this week's Parsha uh, with Yaakov, he appeared to uh, Yaakov in a dream. Uh, but then on Har Sinai, he appeared to um, millions of people, 600,000 men, multiplied by five, six times. Uh, and, uh, and that was after all the great uh, miracles on Har Sinai. And he gave us this book. So we have actually a recording of that moment in history. So this book is much more telling than any beeps that we're going to ever find from out of space because the Kodesh Baruch himself wrote down his understanding, and I have understanding, his, his, his book of creation, which is called the Torah. Okay? So what I wrote here is some of the ways, in, the, in this beginning article, which I'll send to you, is some of the ways, the problem is like this, that the Torah only has 304,840 letters. Okay? So how could all the information of the universe be contained in those letters? That's the question. So the answer is that the, the Torah is a, is a highly compressed document. You've, you've, you've looked at zip files? Yes. Okay. So but what does a zip file do? If I have a line that, has, that looks like this, I can reduce it to 4A and 7D, correct? Right. And then if I have a... Uh, unzip program, which is 64%, I can now uh, reapply the missing letters and uh, reconstitute the letters, right? So the Kodesh Baruch Hu now has this method of compressing information. And what the Torah Shabal Ped does is give us the keys to decompress, it's the decompression program of all, of all the information so that we'll get um, the exact message. Now, here, Rashi said in an interesting Pasuk, it says, V'yom HaShem Moshe, Alai, Alai, come up to me, Ahara, to the mountain, V'hai HaShem, and you should be there. V'yadnet l'cha et haluchos, I'll give you the luchos, the, the, the tablets of Evan, of stone, the Torah, and the mitzvahs, Asher Ketafti l'horosam, that which I have written to teach you. So the book of the Torah is a personal document that the Kodesh Baruch Hu has communicated to, really was supposed to be to all of Klag Israel. He tried it, and twice the Midrash says that it failed. And then we told uh, um, Moshe Ben, you better go up and get it and give it to us. I mean, we, we, can't, we cannot fathom what it means to confront the creator of the universe. It's, uh, it's something that's... Uh, beyond any of our simple minds to confront. And what happened was, when he said the first of the Esa Dibros, the neshamas of all the people went out of their bodies. Of course, when it comes to the, the, the high state of spiritual awareness that that produces, so then the person already has to leave his body. He's, his, his neshama has to leave. It gets uh, The body becomes too constricting. So anyway, after the first two commandments, he, the, the people said to Moshe, Meadow, you go up there. But interesting in this Pusik, Rashi says, Kol Sheish Ma'ot Ushalosh Esrei Mitzvahs Baklal Asera Hadibros Hen. Can you believe it? He says the, ten, the these ten utterances of the Kodesh Baruch, the Eser Dibros, contain within them all 613 mitzvahs. All that information is compressed in that small uh group of statements, okay? So the way that the Kodesh Baruch Hu, uh, compresses all this gigantic information is through compression analogs. And what we have to do is understand how to decompress the information down to every single detail so we'll know exactly that we're doing his will and not something else, okay? Not his will, that's for sure, okay? So now I explain that there's various forms of decoding of information. Uh, them are visual. For instance, in the Torah, we don't have any um, periods of commerce, right? So uh, there's no punctuation in, in, the, in the Sefer Torah. It looks just looks like this. 
So how do we uh, know where to stop and, 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 and where to pause and where to make a new idea? So the Torah has, first of all, two basic um, visual indicators called stumas and petuchas. If you look at the Sefer Torah itself, some of the lines only uh, end in the, in the middle of the line or the beginning of the line, then there's space all the way to the left-hand margin. Other lines have nine spaces, and then there's a continuation of the next word, as in this example. Okay, so the, the, the ones that go to the end of the margin are what we would call paragraph breaks, and these are, uh, which means that a new subject is, is going to, I, I shouldn't say paragraphs, more chapter breaks, and these are paragraph breaks. Okay, which means this is a, a new subject begins after the petucha, and a subsection will be after the stumo. Now that's one visual way that the Torah communicates information. Another way is called the trup or the cantillation. Okay, the the musical notes uh, of the of the trup indicate for us where the breaks are. Okay, um, and. Uh, you may or may not have learned that in your bar mitzvah, but that's what it does. So, for instance, the the uh, here I give an example. The, this is this is this little line here. This line under the word Yishalem, uh, that's called a sof pasuk. Sof pasuk. That means a musical cantillation of ending a line. This little horseshoe here is called an asnachta, which is a comma. Okay. Now, the, the cantillations get very, very serious. For instance, in, in this kind of confrontation of Patifor, when she, she tried to seduce Yosef, it says, V'yima'en, yima'en means he, he uh, paused, he resisted, okay? He, he refused. The mayen is to refuse. So he refused her solicitations. But if we look at the top of the Aleph, we see the trap is called a shalshelis. A shalshelis. That's the longest trap of all the, of all the notes. Okay, and it represents his hesitation. So the musical trap also is an explanation of the text. It explains that it was a. a a, a, a tense moment for him. He had to really fight not to uh, do what she wanted him to do. Okay, so those are the some visual indicators that we have. There's also something called an ideogram. I don't know if you know what an ideogram is, but an ideogram means that it's a um, it's um, a symbol. You know, like you have uh, uh, you know on the train stations, you'll say uh, you know. Uh, I don't know, uh, baggage or something like that. It looked like a bag. Uh, so now the Torah also uses ideograms. In the Torah, if you look at it, the letter pay, in order to be a kosher safer Torah, inside the letter pay, if you look at the negative space, what do you see there? If you look at the white space. It looks like a base. That's right. And if a safer Torah does not have a base inside a pay, it's puzzle. It cannot be used. So, so we're not only going to look at the black letter, we're going to look at the negative space also in order to um, uh, transmit information. Now, the Samach is very interesting because that's another ideogram. The Samach is a letter that's completely closed on all sides. And we have another way of information uh, being transmitted, and that's called gematria. That means each one of the letters in the Hebrew Aleph Bet represents a number. So Aleph is one, Bet is two, Gimel is three. Actually, the word gematria is an interesting word. It, 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 it comes from gamma tria, I think. Uh, gamma is the third letter in the uh, The Greeks took their uh, um, Aleph Bet from us. That's, so gamma is Gimel. Uh, um, Aleph Beit Gimel and Tria. Tria means three, so so it means that the Gimel is three. Uh, okay, the Gamma is three. So with us, the Gimel is represents the number three. The number Samach is the number sixty. 
Okay. Now, in the in Shir Shirim, it says, "Hine mitaso shel Shlomo." Behold, that the uh, the the bed of Shlomo, where he slept, had shish, shishim geburim, sixty strong people, saviv, surrounding it, mi Yisrael, from the strongest men of the Jewish people. So you see that the the number sixty represents strength. And the ideogram, which is the Samak, rep represents Saviv, something that's totally enclosed. So we see that there's even visual indicators, which is going to transmit information to us. Okay. Now we get to more visual indications. There's something called a tag. Do you know what a tag is? Tagging? No. In the Sefer Torah, there are small um, crowns, like in this Alexa, turn on pointer. Uh, there are small crowns on top of uh, some of the letters. Okay. For instance, in this example, you can see this word, the, the Pusik says, Kilo Mechem. This the door is not empty. And the Kuf here, if you notice on top, has a little uh, crown on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, the Rebbe Akiva was able not only to darshan the black letters, the, the, the space, white space, but also he's able to explain information from those tagging, okay? Mm -hmm. From those crowns, okay? Like here, via Paul, okay? So the, the other visual indicators in the Torah are these little dots that sometimes appear like in the sentence, via Paul, Al Savaro, the Yishkehu, the Yifchu. Asaph, when he kissed his brother Yaakov in Bereshis, if you look in the Sefer Torah, the word the Yishakehu has little dots on top of it, okay? As if it's broken, a line broken up. So uh, Rashi explains to us that uh, it was not a, okay? Yeah, it was a kiss that was insincere. He just was doing it outwardly, like a broken line, like nothing very solid. Okay. Now, so not only do we have, uh, so, so we see that there's visual indicators, there's oral indicators. Okay. But the, 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 the basic uh, way that we are going to work uh, uh, recently, I, I, I saw Rashi brought down uh, uh, Gamachas. So we're not talking about uh, this is only for the esoteric people. Okay. As I said, halakhically, if the Sefer Torah doesn't have a bait and a pay, the Sefer Torah has to be uh, discarded. I mean, you know, buried. Uh, uh, it's, it can't, can't be read. Okay. But the basic way that we're going to understand or decode the message of Kodesh Baruch Hu is through what I call common logic. Okay. Now, what's examples of that? So, for instance, um, when it comes to Shabbos, it says, oh, just one second, that's terrible. Enforcing and keeping our citizens safe by arresting robbers and child molesters and home burglars. That is just so terrible. Okay. Um, all right. So, what we're going to be focusing on is the logical ways that language communicate ideas, which I had mentioned the other day, okay? So if uh, here's an example that I just brought down. Uh, it says that um, we're not supposed to do any work on Shabbos. So Yom HaShvi'i, Shabbos, Hashem Elokecha, Lo Tase Kol Malacha, okay? That's what it says. Okay. So the, the word call is a, a word of, is a, um, a, a categorical word, right? That means it, it represents a whole group of works. Okay. Uh, so we're going to have to then define what the subcategories of that are. Okay, but we know one of the ways that the Torah compresses information is instead of writing all the 39 malachas out, it will use a categorical word like kol malacha. You with me? Mm -hmm. So that's a question of how language is used to, to uh, 
to compress information. Instead of writing all the details, you write a general statement. Call Malach, you put everything in there. Okay. Uh, another Pesach says, Zos tia, Zos hachaya asher tochelu. These are the animals that you're allowed to eat. Mikol behema asher arts from all the animals in the arts. So these, this list that follows is a, a word of limitation, which means the others you may you cannot eat, right? That's called a inference. Mm -hmm. So that's another logical way that information is, instead of writing all the ones you can eat and all the ones you can't eat, if I tell you these are the ones you can, then you can infer only these and not others, okay? All right? So um, the first level of... Um, uh, communication through language is what the words say uh, and what the words infer. And that's something that everyone who speaks any language uh, does all the time. Okay, language is, uh, that's the process of language. However, the Torah has certain um, special ways of using uh, uh, language and to communicate information, which is goes beyond what normal logic would dictate. So, for instance, one example is called the Gezerah Shaveh. Gezerah Shaveh is very interesting. Um, um, uh, a man marries a woman with a ring, a Jewish, uh, 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 under a chuppah. Why? Why Why the ring? Because the Mishnah says that you can marry a woman with Kesef Shtar and Bia. The Torah uh, outlines marriage through uh, living together. But there's also uh, an alternative, which is called giving a woman money, okay? The question is, where do we see that in the Torah? Where do we see that marriage can be done with money? It says clearly living together is the consummation of the marriage. So how do we know that you're supposed to give her money, number one? And then another question would be, how do you know you can give her a ring? A ring is not money. A ring is something called material that has monetary worth, that's called Shavu Kesef, okay? So in the end, uh, everybody, uh, all the Jewish chuppas, they're all giving their wives uh, little golden rings, uh, but where do you see that's called marriage in the Torah? Where do we find that? So first of all, we have to define where money is used as a, as a method of marriage. So in the Torah, it says, ki yikach ishi shor, when a man shall take yikach, uh, a woman, and you shall live with her, and then they become man and wife. That word yikach also appears in, in a few few weeks ago in the Pasuk of Avram Avinu, where he buys uh, the field in, in Chaisara, he, he buys the field for to bury uh, his wife or from, from a man called uh, Ephron. He buys the Ephron. There it says, he says to Ephron, Nesati kesev hasoda, kach mimeni. Use the word kach. I'm giving you money. I want you to take it as the consummation of the the, the physical acquisition of this uh, Mara, of this uh, uh, cave. Okay. So the two, uh, the Gemara explains to us that those two words represent a link of concept, which means even though in marriage it, it said the word, it didn't say the word money, but it said the word yikach. And I can import that kicha, that uh, method of uh, taking from the Pasuk of Avram, if you know. Now, you have to know that this method called Gezerah Shava is extremely limited. If you don't have a direct Masara, that means a handed down tradition from your Rebbe, who got it from his Rebbe, who got it from his Rebbe, all the way back to Har Sinai, it is not something that you can do logically. OK, obviously, if you know any a little bit of Hebrew, so in every sentence in Hebrew, we have the word et, it, it, uh, aleph tav, which it was always before a direct object. And it's all over the voracious boy Hashem, et ha-shemayim, et OK, so it's all over the, the world. If, if we could darshan or we can explain the Torah and move information, link information from any word to any word, so we'd end up with one big mess because all uh, practically every Pesach has an et in it, and that would be, would be one big gigantic mess of information. So this this concept of Zerah Shava can only be given to you by your rabbi who got it from his rabbi all the way back, 
okay? But it is a method that Hashem has given to us, to Moshe Rabbeinu, down to us, in order to move information from one place to the next, okay? So there's a whole group of them we say in the morning, uh, uh, 13 of Rebbe Shmuel, uh, of these special ways that the Torah now links information, which uh, may, may not be what uh, uh, common people do when they speak, okay? Yeah, you with me? Right. Now, now, um, beyond the movement of information from place to place, we also have four levels of, uh, four basic levels of information. Actually, uh, there's 70 levels and, uh, in, in the Torah, and each level has 70 levels. But they're briefly met, broke, brought down or broken down into four basic levels. Peshat, Remis, Jush, and Soda. Okay. Peshat means the literal meaning of the text. Okay. Remis is uh, an allusion that the text has to some other text. A drush is usually a uh, moral that's coming out of the text, and so it is the mystical level, okay? Now, we're going to handle only Peshat. In our, in our discussion, we're, we're really just going to handle Peshat. Uh, there's other people that, uh, there's Mitrish Tanchumas, there's uh, uh, the Zohar, there's a whole mystical aspect of Torah. There's, as I said, many different levels. But we're interested in the, I wouldn't call it the simple, the basic level of understanding. And that level is going to communicate to us what exactly to do in our physical reality. Okay. Uh, halakhically, as I said, the definition of all those mitzvahs. Okay. Now, the Torah has a flow of information. We have the physical Torah. Okay. Uh, which was the physical uh, book that we read every uh, week at the, I know, twice or three, actually two times a week and on Shabbos, the Sefer Torah, okay? Now that Sefer Torah is called Torah Shebech Tav. And then we have the oral law, the Torah Shabbat Peh, which is called, which is the, the uh, is embodied in the Mishnah, Okay. The, the Mishnah, it, 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 now, the, the, the Mishnah, each Mishnah has as an explanation, which is called the Gomorrah. The people of the Mishnah called the Naim, and the, their students uh, are, they call the Amarayim, and that's the people that are mentioned in the Gomorrah. The, the next generations are called the Rishonim. Uh, they live uh, around 1100s, and the next generation are called the Poskim. Uh, that's the Torah and the Shulchan Aruch. And then we have what's called the uh, Achronim, which are the post uh, um, uh, uh, post uh, uh, Shulchan Aruch people. Okay. Uh, our sometimes generations, the last generation is called the Achrei Achronim sometimes. Okay. So now, in this thing, I give some basic understandings of what those different levels are. But uh, I'm not going to go through all of that. You can read it by yourself here. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Okay. Now, one of the basic ways that the Torah communicates is called Klaloprat. Okay. Klaloprat means it goes from the general to the particular. It, it breaks things down into categories and subcategories. So I just gave uh, here in this little chart a very a brief uh, overview of the breakdown. You have the Torah, which is called the uh, five books of Moses, right? That's one one unit, the Sefer Torah. That's broken down into five parts, Barashas, Shemos, Vayikra, Devarim, and uh, Bamidbar. By the way, they're separated by around seven spaces. I mentioned that. In, that's how each book is separated. Also a visual, a visual indication, because the Torah is one big squirrel. You don't take out Sefer Barashas when you in the Beit Knesset, you have one big Sefer Torah and it's one scroll, but it's set, each book, book is separated by space, seven spaces. Okay, seven lines, excuse me. 
Okay, so you have Bereshit Shmos V'Ikud Gvarim Bamidbar, and then you have each one of those broken down into uh, uh, into parshiot. So the subcategories in Shemot happen to have eleven parshiot. Okay, now it's important just to, as a side note to know that the paragraphs and uh, verse numbers were done by the Goyim. So you'll see, and if I give you an example, that uh, uh, they, sometimes they were they were on track, and sometimes they're a little stupid. Sometimes they break a chapter in the middle, but absolutely makes no sense. Maybe it was easy to print or something, but it, it's it's not uh, very accurate. The, the reason why we use it is because the first uh, um, the printing press was controlled by the goyim, and they were the ones that printed the Sefer Torah. When they had the, their debates with the Jews, they always wanted to uh, quote uh, chapter and verse. You know, that's how they did it. So they, uh, the, the Jews, had also uh, used that system. But you have to know that the system of uh, uh, chapter thirty-two, line fifteen, is not accurate. OK, we use it in, you know, in our books also, we, you know, we, we uh, print it that way, but it's just printing indications. OK, uh, and there'll be differences between the Masara and what, what uh, how the guy broke it up. Anyway, that's just a side point. The point is that in, in, in uh, the Torah, each one of the books are broken down, as I said, into um, partiote and each parsha, parsha has its breakdown. So if you take this Pasha of Mish- Mishpatim, Mishpatim is the Pasha that talks about um, um, uh, civil law, okay? A civil law, not not uh, the temple or, or, or type of activity or, or, or mice or, you know, taking parts of your, uh, of your field or giving it to the poor, or, you know, so it talks about civil law and there's two parts of civil law. There's, there's, there's civil law, which requires a death penalty and there's civil law, which requires monetary compensation. We have two types. I think in, 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 in America, which they copied, the, the founding fathers of America really read the Bible, you know, and they did a lot of their um, composition of the American government based on what they read in the Bible. So you have, uh, we have a Sanhedrin and they have a Supreme Court, right? Uh, we have the Torah and they have the Constitution. Uh, so they tried to uh, they tried to copy a lot of the ideas that they had learned in the Torah when they created this new form of government called uh, a democracy, which never existed before. Everything was always a monarchy up to that point, uh, or chaos, but uh, monarchy was the basic way things were were done. And they decided they were going to create this new form of government called a democracy. Actually, it was not new. Again, the Greeks have, had already discussed it. But they actually brought it into reality in creation of the man. So they took a lot of the ideas, of course, from the Chumash. So they also have what's called civil courts and courts of capital punishment. And they have different rules that go on. And, uh, of course, they took it from us because we have civil law. That's uh, usually found in the Gemara in Baba Kama, Baba Metzia, Baba Basra. And then we have uh, laws of the Sanhedrin of capital, capital punishment. Okay, but uh, Mishpatim is focused on, um, primarily is focused on uh, uh, um, civil law, although there is in the beginning certain capital punishment when it comes to uh, uh, a person saying bad things to his parents and or hitting them. Okay, we'll discuss that deeper. Anyway, a subcategory of, um, let's say, uh, civil law is damage. Uh, uh, okay, so damage is one of the things that uh, that uh, is spoken about in the Torah, and there it's divided into um, items of uh, property damage, like your animals damaging other animals. Okay, um, um, stealing. Uh, or, excuse me. I'm sorry. Fire. Or, uh, or stealing, okay? So that's the, also a damage for taking away property of someone else, okay? So that's called, uh, we would call that, I guess, uh, laws of damage. I think there's a fancy word they use, torts. I never knew what it meant until I came to the shield, but that's the word that they use. And 
each one of these uh, categories has its breakdown. So, for instance, when animal when an animal does a damage, there's three ways he can do it: either with his horns, or with his teeth, or with his feet. Which means he either gores someone, or he tramples on some uh, produce, or he eats that produce. So it's, that's broken down to three categories. So we see this concept of Klaus and Prat demonstrated and is a very uh, fundamental way uh, of organizing information. If you look at the, um, the um, uh, what is this called, tab up here in Word, okay, they used to be, now it's more visual, but it used to be that you would, uh, they would have drop-down menus instead of all these things, it would say in one menu, cut, copy, and paste, okay? They may even have it somehow uh, in here, for instance. You can see drop-down menus, all right? So in other words, order, then you have the subcategory. Do you want to bring something to the front, something to the back? You know what I mean? So the idea of categorizing is a, uh, a universal idea in transferring of information. And that's one of the basic formats that the Torah uses. It goes from the cloud. The Torah breaks it down into five books. Those books are broken down into parshas. Parshas are broken down to uh, um, uh, subjects of information. And each one of those subjects are further broken down into its subcategories. Okay? So that's uh, a very important method that's used in uh, in communication. All right. So um, what do I have to say here? Now, the Mishnah, it's very interesting when we look at the order of the Mishnah and we compare it to the order of the Chumash. Now, when you read the Chumash in, in every week, so we start from the creation of the world and, and then we go into uh, the problems of uh, the flood and, and Babel, and then we have Avram and Yitzhak and Yaakov, right? And then uh, we have uh, going into Mitzrayim and in the desert, which is basically a historical way of organizing the information. Okay, and the information of any one of the 613 mitzvahs is not limited to one place in the Chumash. Because as we said, there is a interaction between the Pesukim where information flows from uh, a, a book, say, in Vayikra, information can flow into a book of Shemot. Uh, okay. So uh, the, the, the Torah represents what, what I call a matrix of information where we have uh, in, in the world, they call it, they call it um, hubs and links. Okay, Maybe that's what they use, the sentence they use in the world. They, use, they call it hubs and links. Okay, in other words, you have a, a, a pasuk and it's linked to, like we explained with marriage. You have a pasuk which talks about marriage and uses the word yikach, and that's linked to a pasuk of Avram Avinu buying a cave, okay? And therefore, with that link, information moves from one place to the next. So it's a, uh, uh, it's a dynamic interchange of information. That's the Chumash, okay? Where, where Pesukim interchange information with other places in the, in the Chumash. Now, the Mishnah is organized in a different... Uh, uh, pattern, a different style, okay? Instead, the, it, it organizes itself in terms of categories. In other words, the information if, of, uh, of uh, damage can be linked to many different parts, many different pasukim in the Chumash itself, okay? The, the Mishnah is interested not in this um, um, time flow of information and the matrix of the information. It's interested in the categorization of the information. And we'll explain that in a second. So they are, the mission itself is bro broken up to six parts, okay? The six parts are here. They're called Zeroyim, Moed, Noshim, Nezikin, Kachim, and Taharos. Those are the six super categories of the Mishnah. Uh, we, we can, we can remember them by the Hebrew word Zaman Nakat, which is the first letters of those six um, uh, uh, orders or categories of the Mishnah. Zeroim is Zion, Moed is Mem, Noshim is Nun, 
That's man. Zman means time. And nakat means to take. So that's nazigin, kachim, and taharas. Those are the first letters. So you have to take your time and you have to learn Torah with your time. Okay. If you need to do something else because, you know, the world's coming to an end, you may have to save some people. So you have to do it. But our main mitzvah is using our time for Torah. Okay. Now, the, what are these major categories of Mishnah? What do they mean? Okay. By the way, have you ever heard the word Shas? Yes. Okay. Now, people refer to the Talmud as Shas, but really it refers to the Mishnah. And, and it's the first letters of two words, meaning Shisha, Shin, Shisha, Sidre, Mishnah. It means, Shas means the six orders of the, or the six categories of Mishnah. Shisha, Sidre, the six orders, Seders, of the Mishnah. And that's what the word Shas means. Of course, now it includes the Talmud because the Talmud is an explanation of those Mishnayas, okay, of those, but but uh, literally, Shas is the the six orders of the Mishnah. Who, what are they? Okay, so there's Arayim, which are all the laws taken from the Chumash that speak about agricultural laws. Okay, so you have uh, a Shemitah, you have Klein, for instance, you can't do certain certain uh, agricultural things can't be uh, planted together. Okay, the next cat super category is called Moed. Moed means all the holidays. So you have Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, there are many different places, and they are gathered together on the one uh, super category called Moed. And then Moed will be broken down to each one of the holidays, right? So we have a special subcategory on Pesach, one on, on Sukkot, and etc. The next category is called Nashim. Nashim is all the, 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 the uh, categories of laws about women, okay? Marriage, divorce, Yavama, etc. This next category here is called Nazikin. Nazikin is all civil law, okay? All laws of, of damages. Uh, and then we have Kachim, which is the laws of the Beit HaMikdash, and all the Koranim and what they did and all the services. And finally, we have Tahorot, uh, which is the laws of ritual purity, like uh, when, when a woman uh, uh, has her period, so she, she, it's, a, it's forbidden for the husband to live with her, okay? Uh, or certain reptiles, reptiles uh, import impurity, or a dead body imports impurity. And then a person has to go to the mikvah, etc., to get rid of that purity. That's called taharot. Okay, so those are the six major categories uh, of the Mishnah, which gathers the information from that matrix called the Torah into groups. Okay, now each one of them, of course, have their own subcategories. So in the laws of Damage, we have three gates, Baba Kama, Baba Mitzi, and Baba Basra, which is basically laws of damage, laws of uh, a property ownership, okay, and laws of partnerships. Then we have Sanhedrin, the laws of uh, the Sanhedrin, which includes uh, the death penalty. Then we have Makos, which you're learning, which is the uh, those mitzvahs, the negative mitzvahs that have an action, the person you know, who would go over that intentionally is supposed to be hit. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, shulis, taking oaths, eduyos, the laws of testimony, who is a witness, etc. Then we have avodazara, the laws of pertaining to people who has shalom would do idol worship. And we have Mesech Avos, which is the ethical principles of the Torah. And finally, we have Horios, which is uh, the laws of the Dionum, how to make uh, uh, legal, legal decisions. Okay. Now, when it comes to Baba Kama, that's broken down into uh, Prakim chapters. And again, subcategories. We have the, 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 the introduction to the four basic categories of damages. Then we have the explanations of, of those damages, and which are damages of trampling that's called regal, uh, uh, a bore, uh, that means building uh, tripping agents, okay? Um, uh, hitting people, stealing from people, etc. 
Okay. Now, the, uh, uh, the, the first parrot, Dalit Avos, is, is also broken down into subsections, okay, about the general introduction to the four basic categories of damages and then how you have to pay for them. Uh, and then uh, what's called a Tom and Amua, the certain subcategories of animals, and uh, and uh, uh, your obligation to watch. Okay, now in each one of these broken, it's further broken down, okay, to subsections, okay. Um, the, the four Dalit Amos explains to us all the, the those four in detail, all right. Uh, and then uh, what we have, so that's the basic breakdown, okay. Um, the, along with the Mishnah is what we have uh, called Baraitot. Right, tot our information. What happened was Rabbi Yehuda Nasi uh, uh, around around two thousand years ago, a little less actually. Uh, but um, there was a he was a very uh, on very good terms with the Roman Emperor, and the Romans had conquered Eretz Eretz We were sort of a vassal of the Roman state, uh, and uh, but they let us do our thing. They did at that time, though. But then there was a rebellion, and they really knocked us off. But he was uh, a very good. A friend of Antigonus, one of the uh, Caesars there, and he was also a very wealthy man, and he was most of all a very uh, tremendous Talmud uh, scholar, tremendous. Uh, he had learned from uh, Rev Mayer, I won't get into all that uh, discussion, but basically what he did was he got together all the great Chachamim of his generation and he made an official compilation of the Torah Shabbat, which is called the Mishnah. There are texts that he left out, which are called Baraita, the word in Aramaic for to exclude its bar. So these texts were not in his official compilation. They were definitely uh, um, uh, verified texts, but his compilation was the, the briefest uh, compilation of the Torah Shabbat that you could possibly have. So he left out these braces because he felt that that should uh, still be Torah Shabbat Peh. doesn't have to be written down. Uh, there was actually an easer not to write down Torah Shabbat Peh. He did it because uh, when the Romans destroyed uh, Eretz Yisrael, the temple, so uh, the level of Torah study had began to drop drastically, and he had to save the Torah. So he wrote down this the Mishnah, which he, okay. Uh, had, but he left out other uh, parts, and that was gathered together by his students, Reb Chia and Reb Osha, and that's called the Bright Toad. And many times what the Gemara does in order to understand the very brief information in the Mishnah is to bring us Bright Toad uh, to explain what the Mishnah means, okay? So those are called right down. So that's the basic structure of, of the Gemara, okay? And I explain a lot of things here, which you can read yourself, okay? Now, what I am trying to do here is, um, I'm, I'll leave the rest uh, to you. What I'm trying to uh, explain here is uh, sort of an overview of how to uh, introduce people into the depths of Torah learning. Now, that's not done very commonly because... Uh, people don't believe that uh, you can start from zero. <laughs> uh, my Rebbe was a believer in that, and uh, he took people that had very uh, no no knowledge uh, of Torah study and took them from no knowledge to very deep levels of Torah study. Uh, so that was uh, that's where we're coming from. That's where Dash Bereshit come from. Later, later, it, uh, Rabbi Green made the Berachos Torah. My my good chaver, Rabbi Sadin, has one of the top kollels in Israel. So there's uh, a, a lot of Baruch Hashem a fruit that came from Rabbi Goldstein's uh, vision, which was to allow everyone to learn Torah. And I'm in my way have continuing that vision, but I believe that one of the big problems in um, introducing people to Torah is giving them a more structured method to enter into this vast study. 
because you see that how all this information, when I came to the yeshiva, uh, one of the things that my yeshiva was not known for was uh, organization. I actually did a lot of uh, uh, organization in the yeshiva. And the books were all over the place, and the rabbi knew where he had left everything, but the books were all over. And um, together with Rabbi Sackton, we created the first library in the yeshiva, okay? Uh, now you'll go all over Yerushalayim, I'm sure, all over the world, and you'll see uh, a library set up with something like the Dewey Decimal System that you have in the world, but but uh, it's commonly done, okay? But just like the library was not organized, and I had to sort of figure out where everything was and what they meant, so the information also was not organized. So Rabbi Goldstein said, okay, I I'm going to give you guys uh, those people who are, who are new to the story study, a few books, I want you to learn them. So he told us about four books. Three of them are from Reb Moshe Chaim Litzato, and one is by Reb Yitzhak Kompenthal. And Reb Moshe Chaim Litzato uh, lived in around 1730, and he wrote books on common logic, on motivation, and um, on how to understand. Uh, information that is communicated to you. So you have to do two things when you're learning Torah. You have to read information and understand it, and then you have to think about it. Those are two separate separate activities. One is to understand what how words work to communicate information, so that you under, you can you can clearly understand what's being stated. But then you have to think about things. Thinking about things is a much uh, deeper analytic process. So he wrote one book on Tfunos, which is how to understand how words work to communicate ideas. And then he wrote another book on Sefer Higayon, which is how your mind works in the process of analysis. He wrote a third book on motivation, how to use language to motivate people, because we have a heart and we have a mind. So the mind tells us information, but the heart tells us what to uh, do. That's why it's called a motivator. The motivation comes from the heart. Okay, it motivates you, but you have to know what you're motivated to, you know. Uh, and the Torah it tells you intellectually what to do, and then you have to the, your heart motivated to do the Torah and not us for showing other things. Okay, so he wrote a book on information, two books on information, which is understanding and, and analysis, Funos and Higayon, and the third one on motivation, which is a different topic altogether, how to use language to motivate. And those books are all available uh, uh, online. I, I, I taught all the classes. Uh, I, I went through all the books, okay? So you can actually, again, I don't know how people actually take advantage of it. They know, even know it exists, but it's a, it's a gold mine of, of, of information to anyone who's serious about entering the study of Torah seriously. Uh, so those are those three books. Now, the other book that he handed to us was called Dark A. Um, HaTalmud, which, as I told you, the the, uh, the Goyim refused uh, our permission for us to use the word Talmud, so it was uh, translated as Dark and Gemara, but originally it was Dark and Talmud. Uh, and what that does is teach us not the rules of common logic, but the special rules that um, exist in the Torah itself, okay? Uh, and that's very, very important because we need two levels of understanding. We have to know common logic. If your mind doesn't work uh, to understand uh, common logic, then you can't go forward and uh, build to the next level, which is uh, Zara Shavas, Binyanabs, and all the special way to, the special Torah ways of communicating information. So those are the four books he told us. And he said, look, I don't have time to teach you all of them. Uh, uh, take them, learn them and you'll be able to get into this study without uh, 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 going through uh, you know, the 20 years that we didn't have uh, when, we, when we came to the issue, 20 years plus, okay? So what I did with my Chaber Reb is we translated the books in English, we made charts, uh, I did my website, I, I'm trying to, um, um, bring that to the world, which is a more conscious or methodical or systematic way of entering into the study, because the study of Torah is very big, as we mentioned. 
It has 70 levels, and each level has 70, and, and it's a very, it's a, it's a text from the Kodesh Baruch Hu. So it's greater than any text in the universe. That's why it's the number one bestseller throughout the world, and there's nothing that compares to it. No spiritual text or no secular text that compares to the breadth and the depth of information that's contained in the Torah. And that's because it comes from the Kodesh Baruch Hu itself. That's, uh, it couldn't be a greater author than that. But along with that uh, great author comes a challenge. The challenge is to be uh, um, um, proficient enough to understand the information. Okay, you're going to an, an advanced physics class, you wouldn't, as I said to you, you have to know a little <laughs> mathematics and algebra uh, and calculus before you can get to that. Uh, and basic physics before you can get to the advanced physics. So the Torah is a very, very, very deep uh, text, and it requires uh, a lot of uh, um, preparation to understand how to do it. But if we can break down the information in, uh, in, uh, into units, as these great rabbis have done, it'll help us tremendously to be a participant of real Torah and not just to be a dabbler in Torah. OK, so that's basically the idea that I that I had. And the second problem that I confronted, which one was just the information. How is the information um, communicated? That was problem number two. Then the second problem was to apply that information to the Torah itself. In other words, there's a theoretical construct of how the information works. And then there's a practical way that we see it operating in specific examples. And that's two different uh, worlds that are of course associated, but uh, most people either stay in the theoretical and don't do the practical or do the practical and don't go to the theoretical. And, and what I wanted to do is to put those two worlds together in a, in a practical example. So I took a, a, suit, a very small um, line in, in the, the Chumash, which talks about a very non-threatening uh, uh, um, piece of information, which is basically when you pay for damages, uh, you can use money, or you can use uh, items of worth, which are both movable and static, i.e. land and movables. As long as those items of worth have the value of your damage, you can all use them for payment. Now, that's a very small topic. As I said, it's not very controversial. People don't get upset about it. You know, it's not murder. It's not, uh, you know, marriage. It's a, And I did it purposely uh, because I wanted to separate the emotion from the information, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so I took this pasuk and I watched it uh, from the Chumash, go into the Mishnah, go into the Gemara, go into the Rishonim, go into the Tur and the Shulchan Aruch and the Meforshim on both those texts, and then go into the rabbis like the Vilna Goin in the, in, uh, down to our present generation. And I traced what the information was and how it was handled. And the reason I did that is because I wanted, again, to put together the theoretical and the practical, and I wanted to see what the learning process is. And my Rebbe always used to say, Torah, Torah, teach me. Let the Torah itself teach you the system. And it does. It's a very unusual uh, text. It, it actually not only teaches you the information, but it also teaches you how to learn it. Okay? But you have to be skilled at it, and you and you need help. There's, it's too big and too vast. You can't jump into the advanced calculus class without the, the preparation. So these books represent the foundation uh, tools to help us. Okay. Now, practically speaking, when I teach people, it's um, difficult to give them all that information in a short period of time. Uh, people say to me, wait, that's 50 classes over there. Rabbi, you want me to listen to 50 classes? Well, again, if you're serious, you should. I mean, if you just want to dabble and say that you've had a Torah experience, uh, okay, so we can have a Torah experience together. We can dabble. I'll tell you a little about Musa. I'll tell you about davening. I'll tell you a little about Shabbos. You know what I mean? And you'll learn a few things here and there, but that's called a dabbler. If you want to be serious about relating to Kodesh Baruch Hu, you want to be the fish that actually can look out there and communicate with that, that uh, 
person out there, Lahav Deh, we're not talking about Hashem as a person, but I'm just saying if you want to learn the language to communicate to this higher uh, uh, creation, the creation, the creator of the whole world, so it's going to require um, giving your time and your effort to it. Okay. Now I realize that people are not going to do that. So what I did was I took one example and I slowly bring the theoretics of the learning into that example. So you have a live example. You could say, yes, I am learning Talmud page uh, nine and page six. And yet you're going to be seeing what is being done with a uh, a construct with a theoretical construct, which is showing you the process that's going on. So you're going to learn the process in a hands-on uh, a case. That's really what I have created. Uh, it just requires, uh, the beauty of it is that if you have a healthy mind, you don't have to be the villain going. You just have to have a normal working mind. I mean, you don't, you're not, you know, in, the, in fantasy world or, you know, in, in, uh, doing other crazy things. And you don't, you know, like the, it's difficult when I teach sometimes the younger people because they have all this emotional agitation. When am I going to get married? And uh, what about my cell phone? And, you know, all this emotional garbage, you know, so it, that 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 has a lot of static. But if you're a mature adult and you have a normal, healthy mind there, the, the amazing thing is that you can learn Torah. OK, you don't have to be fed, uh, 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 um, um, you know, uh, to, uh, these books that say, uh, um, you know, a uh, uh, student's guide to uh, to uh, <clears throat> to brachas. You know what I mean? You don't have to even, you know, read Shmir uh, Shabbos uh, Kolchasa. Not that you should. You actually, you actually should. But I'm just saying that you're able, you're able to do the activity yourself. If you apply yourself, that's all. You just have to apply yourself. But knowing the the parameters of the rules is extremely helpful. Extremely. I, I've speak, spoken to a lot of people, and they know a lot of Torah, but they don't know how it works. And since they don't know how it works, they're basically repeating what's being said, but not understanding what's being said. Okay. So that's that's the um, introduction. OK, now what I did with you the other week was gave you uh, an idea of what I actually do, which is take a small section of one of these four books, present it and then show you how it's working in reality. So we took a uh, a, a, uh, a small section of Dr. Gamara. OK, uh, I hope I have it here. Let's see if I open it. Yeah, here. Okay. We took that small section of Dr. Gamara. We outlined it. In, in the book, it's just one line after another. Okay. And no periods, no nothing. And you're supposed to know Hebrew so well that you, and your mind's supposed to work so rapidly that you can organize this. And all I did, I never changed the words of the text. All I do is I add outlining letters to it so I can see what the author uh, is saying because when he wrote these words, he was extremely organized. Everyone that you're dealing with here in Torah is extremely organized. We said that the Mishnah is called Sisa Sidre Mishnah. Sidre means Seder. Okay, so all the people that we're speaking about are highly organized in their thinking and in their writing also. So he taught us these basic beginning rules. These are the beginning rules of what you do to learn. You look for extra physical language or ideas. There's two points here. We said there was the language, the words being used, and the ideas being expressed. We can't have extra words. Hashem is very economical in his language. Okay? So we can't have extra words, repeated concepts. We also have to have new ideas in every line. There has to be a new vista, like Shabbos, I explained to you, has to be a new vista. It can't just be, well, let's just not work. It has to be a new vista of understanding when you go into shallows okay number three you have to look for changes of um, language physical language or subject matter transitions or uh, in law and then after you've done those observations you have to study 
investigate and ask if you see until you can find the meaning of all those anomalies. OK, we said in, in science, people look for an anomalies and they don't say, well, Hashem made a mistake when he created Mars and it doesn't work like the other planets. It says we didn't understand something. So if you realize as a creator of the world who is very orderly, you'll go into being a scientist because you realize you can actually discover things about the order of the universe. So when you see an anomaly, we don't say, well, Hashem made a mistake that day. We said, no, there must be some principle that's causing that anomaly, okay? So whenever you see one of these anomalies in language, then you have to say to yourself, uh-oh, that's a red flag. Hashem is communicating some idea. Why is this happening? Okay, and in the end, you have to be very clear that you understand in any halacha what the source is, what is the essential halacha, and the gvul, how far does it extend? We spent a lot of time talking last time about borders. Borders are very important because they define those mitzvahs, okay? Now, we gave this example. I'm just kidding. I know you have to go, right? We're a little over time. So, just one second. Uh, uh, I'm teaching now, uh, Ima, okay? I'll be few, uh, finished in five minutes, okay? Sorry for that introduction. interruption. Okay, so last time we took two pasukim and we saw that it represented the idea of kafal enyin and we put them in a table and we said we have the one who's doing the action, the one who's receiving it, the action that's being done, and the result. And we notice that in, in, in these two pasukim, there are shinui lashin. Sometimes the, the uh, subject is, is mentioned, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's mentioned in two different languages, okay? And we brought Rashi to say, I will explain to you these variations or these shinui, the, these changes in language between these two verses and show you that far from being repetitious, they are defining borders. OK, so in the end, what I did was I just made this little chart of the actors. There's a, a man, a woman and a uh, and a uh, minor. OK, and um, how each one of these two pasukim define those parameters. If 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 it just would have said each, I would have just stopped at, the, at these two uh, sections. OK. Uh, excuse me, it says Maka Ish. I'm sorry, it says Maka Ish Humes. It does not say the poll in this one. There's a zero here. So I would have gone all the way down here, but the point of the other Pasuk Ish now pulls up the bottom level out of the cut and range because you have to be a um, uh, a, uh, a, 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 uh, a major, what they call an adult, okay? And the same type of activities were happening uh, in this Pasuk where we were defining the victim. If I only had the victim as Ish, I would say maybe Ish sure who gets murdered doesn't get the death penalty, could get other punishments than the death penalty. And then we said Kol Nefesh exp expands that uh, um, um, list down to the Katan. Uh, maybe it expands it down to a, uh, an Afila, a, uh, a, uh, a, um, a miscarriage, uh, uh, a kid that doesn't uh, uh, first 30 days he's called an, an AFL. That means he, we don't know if he's going to live or not. Uh, and the answer is no. He has to have the quality of Ish, which means he's a Bar Kayama, which he, uh, he, he's going to exist. He can't be someone in a doubtful stage. So we see how the borders now are being created through the interaction of these two pursuit games. So not only do you have to learn what the, what the, the Pusik says, not only the inference of the Pusik, you have to now compare that. And if we do see any of these, uh, Repetitions, we have to now be very careful, medactic and Russian, uh, very careful, and then through the careful analysis, we'll then be able to create the spread of um, uh, responsibility, either from the one who did the action or the one who received it. Okay, so we're going to stop, we're going to end this here. That was a 